Hello, everyone. Hello, Morning. everybody. Hello. Good morning. And well, let's afternoon go on and evening. Yeah. Um, and all of this. Um, we are now live on Facebook as well. So I will share the, the link in uh, the chat here. Um, I just want to welcome everyone to another virtual pinup of um, MACAD. Um, this is a Master for Advanced Completion in Architecture and Design uh, that is focused on teaching the uh, most relevant uh, digital software and computational strategies for AEC fields today. Uh, we count on an amazing uh, team of faculty and uh, also guests and of course students that are located um, in various parts of the world. Um, and uh, we um, are now part of, or now finalizing the module that is called um, Digital Tools for BIM and Smart Construction, uh, where we are focusing on the most relevant paradigms of, um, of BIM, integrative modeling, collaborative workflows, and cloud-based data management. So Luis Ferrauda and Will Pearson are going to be leading the discussion today, and they are also leading the, um, the seminar that is called Digital Tools for Cloud-Based Data Management. And with this, I will let them introduce themselves, uh, introduce the um, course and the, the brief, and of course, um, then we will introduce the jury as well. Thank you, Anna, and thank you, um to you for, for helping us uh, coordinate the course and, and making this experience uh, much smoother than, than, than I expected at least. Um, so I really appreciate your, your help with everything. Um, hello everybody, uh, my name is Luis Fraguada. I'm a developer and third-party developer support supporter at McNeil Europe. Um, I'm here with Will Pearson, who uh, I'm lucky to to work with and lucky to have had uh, join me in this uh, in this uh, course uh, to teach this course. Uh, Will is a, a developer at uh, McNeil, um, working on all sorts of things from uh, our development libraries, uh, DevOps, um, and yeah, making making Rhino, uh, building Rhino, at all all steps of the way. Um, we have uh, a great jury here to join us. Um, uh, Emil Polson from Thornton Tomasetti. He's an engineer and developer uh, there, um, and very important to uh, to actually what we've been talking about because uh, um, was one of the people who uh, I guess hacked on Rest Hopper uh, several years ago and and made uh, remote solving of Grasshopper definitions possible, which is really what we're talking about today. Um, we have Basia Adzaman who is a creative developer at Space Store, um, linking cloud-based interfaces to uh, Revit models and different CAD uh, systems. And we have Izzy Lysogen, I hope I didn't, I hope I said the last name correct, uh, who's an engineer and developer at, uh, at Speckle, which is a um, cloud-based, uh, let's say, object data um, communication platform. I'm sure there's, Plenty of ways you could uh, describe Speckle, um, but it's uh, it's one of those things. Um, let me let me just briefly mention what we've been doing in the course uh, since January. Uh, Will and I have uh, been uh, with the students going through basically how we can get um, how we can create interfaces, online interfaces, where um, users can interact with a, a more complex logic that is eventually solved elsewhere. Um, we used the tools that we've been working on um, prior to the Rhino 7 release, uh, specifically um, uh, Rhino Compute, so running Rhino on a, on a server uh, with a, with a let's say a, an application that's listening uh, for, for different requests, uh, different geometry calculation requests uh, via via an REST API. Uh, we've also used a few of the other libraries that have also, um, let's say, matured in the Rhino 7 release cycle, including Rhino 3DM uh, JS, and another project that we have called App Server, which facilitates uh, the hosting of Grasshopper definitions for remote solving. Um, so, you know, that there's a lot there, but really we, we started from uh, basic just HTML and JavaScript, CSS, uh, with the idea that uh, the students could, could 
for the most part, stay within uh, the environment that they know, which is Grasshopper, and try to uh, build as much of the logic and as much of the styling for the cloud-based interface uh, within that. And, and then, you know, us sort of creating the infrastructure to support that. Um, that being said, you know, there's, of course, many steps of the way where we had to touch some JavaScript code, um, style up some markup in HTML. And um, so the students also got you know, exposure of what it actually what it actually takes to uh, to do that. Um, Will, I don't know if there's anything that I missed there that you want to mention. No, I think you covered it all all, all very well. Um, I will just uh, second uh, the the thanks to to Ohana and 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 to our to our jury today. Um, but yeah, covered it covered it beautifully, and it's been a, a very interesting journey. Excited to show everyone. Yeah. Yeah, I'm particularly excited that we have the people that we have here because either I've met them directly and respect what they do or just respect what they do and unfortunately haven't met yet, but um, I think we have the right people to to have this discussion today. They're people who either have helped develop the kind of stuff that we're doing, uh, have applied um, the tools that we've made um, or are working, you know, in, in you know, parallel fields uh, dealing with the same issues. So. Um, I'm really glad that we're able to, to get everyone, uh, Basia, Izzy, and Emil here with us uh, today. Uh, the format that we're going to take on today is um, essentially different sessions with different chunks of videos, uh, four or five videos per session, which Will and I have curated um, based on the, let's say, the, the outcome of the, of the project. And yeah, I think we have five or six different sessions, uh, three that deal with, uh, let's say, more architecturally related uh, projects, uh, another session that deals with product configuration, uh, another session that deals um, with um, maybe projects that, that dealt with analysis in some format, um, and then another session about related to, to just dealing with geometry. Um, the, the, the project itself uh, essentially is you know, getting a grasshopper definition uh, to be solved uh, in the cloud uh, with the random compute technology. So the students um, have somewhere, uh, probably a Node.js server uh, running uh, on Heroku that uh, has these, uh, these grasshopper definitions and they've created a, an interface um, with, you know, input elements like uh, sliders or text areas or buttons, et cetera, that eventually evoke uh, a recompute um, and you know, new geometry to come back. Uh, so this is, uh, this is the gist of it. Um, should we get uh, started with the first session? Sure, let's go for it. Sure, yeah. I was committing the uh, grave Zoom sim, sim of speaking with my microphone off then. Um, I was just trying to, uh, Put together a a bit of a um, uh, Louis spent a bit and I spent a bit of time sort of curating the session, figuring out you know how long how long to 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 reach the discussions and things. So I'm, I'm while this first session is playing, I'm going to try and um, share that so you can at least follow along, um, and it should help us keep on 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 time as well. But yeah, I've got the um, I've got the sessions queued up here. Okay. All right. So I think if I bear with me, this is the first time that I've uh, I've done video. Hello, everyone. Okay. This is an updated submission. Uh, mm, I'm not getting any sound. Um, we hear so the sound. Here we are again. You hear the sound. This is. Yes. Oh, it's, just, it's just me who doesn't hear the sound. Okay, I'll stop talking then. <laughs> the index. Um, and here you can see you can find the local server assignments, the first ones. I only embedded the second one because otherwise it kind of makes the page look messy and uh, takes a while to load. Here at the bottom, you can find um, you can find more information about my work. And so let's jump right into it. This is taken from my personal website, the logo. And this is a painting of mine. I'm kind of self-promoting over here, self-marketing. I like to paint. 
Um, and if you if you move the mouse over, it shows the ID tag. And here I also embedded a podcast that I recorded. A uh, podcast meaning an electronic music set. <laughs> if you like electronic music, maybe it's for you. Um, and I also embedded my personal website, which looks quite nice all together, all black on black. You can scroll through these paintings, um, and check out the others. So yeah, um, let's jump right into the second assignment. Um, the second assignment. I realize I forgot to mention um, before we started some of the, so we asked the students to submit three minute long videos. And obviously with a lot of students, we really need to try and keep to that. So any any of the students that ran over um, by a, a uh, significant amount, we've kind of, uh, um, I've got a list of time codes here that I'm just gonna like sort of jump between just to uh, just to focus on the on on the on the main final project that um that we asked them to su submit so i'm just going to uh, do that right now uh, all right this is the final assignment um and so maybe i just want to show you this this is what it's meant to look like with a bouncer solver for our studio project. The kind of generation of shell for the kangaroo taking inflating the, the mesh of the massing. And so more or less it looks like this. Uh, inflated with some, some values here. But yeah, maybe maybe let's go back to this. Make it a bit bigger so it all fits. going a bit over time so yeah and you can see the iterations the progression it starts off kind of a boxy similar to the mesh um, yeah it's I had some trouble with the with kangaroo but more or less this is this is how it's meant to be yeah. Yeah, and then it progresses into a very nice blob, organic blob. And I use this, uh, I don't know, unicorn puke coloring of the, of the curves. And of course, you can play with all these values, all the scaling, uh, let's scale it in all, all the directions. See how it impacts the geometry of the mesh. But yeah, that's the idea. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Marissa, and this is a final presentation for uh, digital tools for cloud-based data management. And I will show you my um, app that we developed for the final presentation. Here is a gallery of um, all the tests and trials that we've made throughout the semester. And this one here is uh, the Getaway Orb. It's um, the final uh, app that I made for this class. Um, the intention is to have some data visible on the web um, from the from Rhino. It's data embedded in the Rhino um, visible on the web, and also to have um, some fun tools to play around with the sliders. And this is uh, related to my studio project. Uh, it's a, a moon colony and it's a, sort of a kit of parts. Uh, the entire project is made out of seven modules. And here, if you can see the pink stuff is a static model from 3DM Loader. Um, if you click on it, you'll get to see uh, the, the information of the parts, the different parts that make the project uh, the whole. And then you have the grasshopper definition part of the app, which is more of sort of like a fun 
that's the addition, uh, the getaway orb, fly away on your moon orb if you get tired of staying indoors. So you can spend and it will just to tweak that little orb in the middle. And then you can play around with the seed. And the size of the orb. Very simple, very, very simple, uh, I guess, interactive little tool. I've added some lights and I've added a ground plane uh, for, for visuals. And that's all. Thank you. Hi, it's me, Noah Pan. Today. I'm just going to see if I can uh, restart this, maybe make it so that I can hear this as well because it would be useful. Um, but how's it working so far? Is it coming through OK, not too choppy? Yeah, it looks all right. Good. Awesome, awesome. I can just, I can just um, make up what they're saying in my head. You could open um, it on Facebook. And see yeah, I think, I think that might kill my, kill my connection, and, and, and I'd have to open Facebook. Um, uh, yeah, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll carry on trying to uh, um, figure out what's going on behind the scenes. All right. Okay, I'm going to present uh, what I have done in the data management class. So uh, the first uh, project is to create a site with the description and the image. I want to uh, test like uh, how can I create like a block of the window here that show the image inside. I also apply the um, animated uh, information when I scroll the mouse over, it gonna uh, react um zoom in here so it look like uh the the world is getting closer and the next one is to create uh oops, sorry and the next one is to create um, rhino geometry inside the browser in this case uh i name it the project what is in the box so i assign the action when i click um the geometry it's the the surface that cover um, the geometry inside gonna show like uh, what is inside the box so i add the object and then it show it and it just play around with this as a game and the next one is to create the grasshopper and definition and the parameter so in this project uh, i assign the base uh, points uh, with the four corner to create um, uh, a pixelate uh, rectangular extrusion here. Also, we can add it the uh, division to the uh, script. Moreover, um, I create a command download where like we can have like a specific uh, number that we have uh, modify as the input on showing here as a name. So in this case, we can specify the type of the uh, uh, parameter that we have created here. And the last two project is still loading, but I have prepared in the uh, Heroku opening here. So the project right here is to um, create the building with the courtyard. So in this case, I have like a two building right here that can modify in terms of the height and in terms of the uh, width and length, but the part didn't show here. So uh, anyhow, like we can create a different height and uh, corresponding to the color, the 
according to the C uh, axis value. Um, then the courtyard will be responding to the, the size of the building as well. And my last project is to uh, bring out the number into visualize it as a text. Uh, in this case, I create a pavilion that have like a different size of the panel um, according to the division UV. And if I change the division to higher, it will subdivide it more. Also, if I move the point, it add will as well like uh, change the geometric of the pavilion roof. And in this case, I uh, use the uh, uh, com component that can project the shadow on top of the ground. So we can see which variation can have like a shading for the people underground, oh, under, under the roof here. So uh, the text is um, Frip, I think is. So this is another case where I'm just gonna uh, skip ahead to the next one, next one now. Hello, my name is Dong Yub Lee. I'm gonna explain my final project. So basically there are three different functions. The first one is the exploded height. So minimum height mean is like a, everything merging together. This is the original structure. And when you change it to the, the maximum value, it's the exploded view. So you can see everything individually. So you can control the structural thickness, so like a thinner and thicker. And I prefer the fixed camera view. So when you change the those values, actually the camera is always stay there. So that's why I made an extra button to reset the view. And so when I generating this 3D object, I use the two different uh, method mixed together the byte array and the usual string. So I use the byte array for the, the diffuse color because of it's easy and very, like I can check the color inside of Rhino and Grasshopper much fast. And also I use the usual string to control this like a object like individually. Like display the edges and the flat shading and animation. I use the user string to control everything like a, like a one by one. So some object has the edges and some object has the, the flat shading and also some object has the, the animation. So use of the user string, I can control everything like individually. So if I put some special string inside of this object, it automatically trigger the animation or change the, the shading or display edges or not. And very last thing is the control start stop animation because when you change the explode, explode the height is a very small size, animation is supposed to be stopped because of it, if animation is, is, is playing and everything is overlap. So, so when you change it, the value a little bit higher, then animation will start. Thank you. Hello, my name is Natalia Voinova, and I will present the project I've done within the curves of the cloud-based data management. It is based on our studio project, the energy and water plant for the moon settlement. Our design is informed by the set conditions, which include the absence of atmosphere, low gravity, harsh radiation, and extreme temperature difference between day and night varying from 270 degrees below zero Celsius in the shadow to 170 above in the sunlight. We decided therefore to dig all the inhabited spaces underground where the temperature is constant and the soil protects humans from the radiation, leaving only the solar harvesting infrastructure on the moon surface. Consequently, our project largely has the interior spaces to show and this provides some difficulties in demonstrating its overall spatial structure circulation, etc. We had to choose a language of presentation that would allow to see all of this, but at the same time show that it all is underground. The objective of my work was to push the boundaries of the conventional design presentation over web. What we are usually showing 
a static renders drawings or videos, but in any case, it is only us telling the story, while the viewer is bound to follow our narrative. My idea was to give the audience the opportunity to examine our project from a different point of view, following their own scenario. The model from Rhino has been published to web, with the tools to walk through it, fly around it, and zoom into every corner. This provides a totally different experience and makes the communication with the design really interactive. Another convenience tools are the information. The single click on every object brings out its name and short description, and the transparency mode, the double click on the object, makes the external skin invisible and reveals its interior. The skin can be switched off for the single object as well as the for combination of objects, and then switched back on. All the presentation features are linked to the materials in the Rhino file. The simple viewer adds a great deal to the web presentation and has a great potential for the communication with the client and the society. It can come very handy for the needs of the participatory design and for all kinds of educational media. Nowadays, as the online practices have been strongly pushed forward by the new pandemic and post-pandemic reality, the quality of the remote communication cannot be overestimated. The only real problem I see so far is the limited ability to display the complex and heavy geometry with a lot of details. However, I believe that the development of the computational capacities available through web will grow and this problem will be solved. At least, it's already clear that the demand of such interactive features does exist, so the technology should meet it. Thank you. That's it. Hello, uh, my name is. Okay, that was the that was the first group um, of uh, sort of interactive architectural models. Um, let me just stop sharing. Um, uh, Luis, do you mind um, uh, sort of leading the discussion on this? I'm just going to see if I can fix my headphone issue. Um, sure. Sounds good. I'll jump back in. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think there, you know, one thing that we can discuss is is the value of, um, I think, as Natalia just uh, was mentioning, is like you know the the value of bringing this or making this kind of logic more more accessible, um, and that you know whether that is uh, uh, just you know a model that you know has a certain organization and even just playing with materials or in Don Yub's case the the animation um, you know can be just uh, so much more effective than you know just passing either you know just a static renders or or images you know to be able to experience this um, this uh, spatially you know through uh, in an accessible way so I think that's um, you know that's one of the I think highlights that I take away from from this first group and of course, you know, the rest of the, uh, the projects. Um, you know, there's, there's also obviously as well what's, what's been commented, there's a, there's a consequence not to any, any medium that we choose. Um, and in this case, you know, we, we have to, you know, very early on in the class, you know, the, I believe the second assignment was, uh, the second session was bringing in um, models uh, into, into 3JS. So taking Rhino models, um, and importing them with the Rhino 3DM loader that we've developed for 3JS. And, you know, this, we, we didn't, of course, Will and I, you know, have show, show examples with, you know, a couple of spheres or a couple of boxes. And then, you know, we, we start to get questions like, uh, why is my, you know, I get this error, my model's not working. And we're seeing like one gigabyte models with textures that are, you know, 90 megabytes or something and um this is also something that we we kind of um we we should have anticipated of course because we're here we're dealing with architecture students that have models with you know thousands and thousands of elements they want them to look beautiful so their textures are going to be super high res so when, when they render something um it looks it looks great um so yeah you have these the kind of like uh, consequence of the medium um and I want to maybe uh, ask uh, ask the jury if you know how they how they approach this or how they how they deal with this. It's always a challenge to to find the the golden middle uh, of um, how to make the models lightweight but also uh, look good. 
uh, and performance in the end is the most important thing. If someone doesn't uh, have a good connection and the model doesn't load, then the whole project is useless. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's really important to um, to to optimize all the models and and with Rhino um, in the 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 Rhino three JS loader, it's it's quite heavy, <laughs> but. Um, yeah. Yeah, the, if you add textures to it, then uh, yeah, <laughs> and it's very, very heavy. But yeah. the way I, I went around it is that I added all the textures um, as the material um, properties in 3JS instead of adding them uh, in Rhino. But obviously, if you if you add all of the um, texturing properties, they, they stay there. So um, yeah, changing the image, uh, just on the website is, is easier for now. <laughs> but Lewis, I believe in you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bastia. That, that means a lot. Um, yeah. And how about in engineering, Emil? I mean, I'm sure if you're taking a whole building, you know, and you're not going to probably be passing around, um, you know, I beam models or something like that, you probably have, you know, different representations, <laughs> no? Of, of course, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, it's it's um, it's very much about what are we communicating and what is important here, and really trying to trying to focus on that. And because uh, um, obviously, like you, I mean, you're in control of your model that you're you know publishing and uploading. So um, you can obviously do sort of a filter. You can have sort of mechanisms to filter out information that isn't necessarily. I mean, if it's if it's a uh, the use case that you want to really optimize, then you can even go ahead and, and think about how much can we actually do on the front end side as opposed to the back end side. I mean, I mean, I think I beams is a pretty good example. It's like you can obviously, like let's say that you have a curved beam and you want to visualize this in the browser. I mean, one approach is just to build a mesh in 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 uh, in Rhino right away with you know tons of nodes and and, and faces, or you can actually just um, you know um, upload the curve and then have some some sort of um, you know, profile information and do the extrusion uh, in the browser. So I guess you can be a little strategic about so where, where do we sort of generate the information? Because um, what we actually end up doing uh, a lot is, or I guess some some complaints that we get a lot is, is, is um, you know, just transmission, like sending data from one place to another place. And if you can really optimize the way that um, data is sent, then you can gain quite a lot from that as well. Uh, another thing that I wanted to mention, I mean, we, we're talking obviously about, um, um, you know, Rhino 3DM uh, file format, which is kind of natural in the context, right? But uh, I would also like to um, uh, just, you know, uh, say something about GLTF, which is a pretty interesting format, just in terms of loading things really, really fast. Uh, so GLTF is a, you know, 3D format, just, you know, sort of really optimized for, um, you know, transmission, right? Like as a web-based uh, 3D format. Uh, also, exp I mean, you probably you guys probably know more about this than, than what I do, but we end up using it a lot when we load or when we have to load heavy models quickly. Because there is also, you know, a matter of, of um, kind of parsing models when you actually, you know, when the model arrives in the front end, you will have to turn it into some information that your browser can understand, right? So if you can actually have that information expressed in a format um, that the browser will understand right away, then obviously you can sort of skip that step. So that's another interesting aspect of just, uh, you know, sort of optimizing performance. But um, um, yeah, that's another topic, but uh, super, super cool to see these projects, very impressive uh, with, with, with everything. And um, yeah, I think, I think this is an excellent, um, you know, showcase study of, of uh, how architects can, can really utilize the, the sort of idea of computation in the browser and, uh, you know, also have that sort of interactive uh, uh, visualization, really cool. You're going to yeah, have I mean, to say that after uh, each of the sessions now. Sorry, you go, you go Luis. No, no, I was just going to say that, um, yeah, what, what you're mentioning there and, and kind of being really in control of of all the aspects of it. I, I mean, I can imagine um, all of you at Speckle are, are just like trying to, you know, imagine how to even optimize, you know, how to even send a, a vertex or, or any of these things because you're, you know, pushing Mm -hmm. all this stuff through 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 pipe so how do you deal with this uh how do you make the the smallest representable unit of something 
Yeah, so for complex geometry, like that was actually a huge problem that, that kind of happens if you have like a giant mesh, you can have like thousands and thousands of vertices. And we actually found that for something like that in particular, like having individual point objects was actually very inefficient. And instead of doing that, like when you're going from, um, like if you have something simple, then the points are useful because they have additional information. But if you have something like a huge mesh, it was really just simpler to flatten it down to a list of integers and then like chop that up when you receive it again. And then obviously batch that when you're sending. So you're not sending everything at once, but you're sending like you chunk that huge list of vertices into maybe like 10,000 per chunk and then you send those individually. Mm. Um, and then on the engineering side, I also wanted to add to that, like one thing that we tried to, because I previously worked in engineering MEP as well. And I feel like the BIM mentality is like more information is better. Put everything you can in the robot model and this robot model will be massive and everyone who opens it will have to wait 20 minutes for it to open because there's so much data in there. <laughs> and one thing we're trying to encourage a bit more with sort of like our like 2.0 data model is that like you don't need everything in the model for it to be useful. And sometimes like depending on who is receiving that data, like a lot of that data is probably not important to them and it just adds to the weight of the model and the weight of the data you're sending. So like having some granularity in what you're sending um, and not just sending like literally every rivet parameter and everything on top of that. And also like kind of deciding how to display it on the other end. Um, like uh, Basia was saying, like depending on connection, like you want to kind of find the middle ground between like people with like in London with great internet and very high powered PCs, um, being able to like have a good experience while also balancing people who are like maybe on a train or like traveling on their laptops and having like very poor connection, unreliable connection and probably not as powerful a PC. You don't want like, two frames a second for them and then like a kind of um, disappointing performance for someone with a better setup. So kind of finding a way to grade the performance based on who is receiving it um, kind of also adds on to what Emil was saying, like sometimes you can um, kind of justify like computing a whole mesh or a whole brep and sometimes maybe just the baseline is enough. Um, and you can kind of decide that based on the situation as well and depending on what application you're in. Yeah, lots of things to consider. <laughs> yeah, ab 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 absolutely. Um, yeah, I think that's um, it. Touches on 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 something I want to kind of like uh, just sort of put in you guys ears for sort of future um, discussion during during this session. That um, you know, some of what what Luis and I we kind of framed this project around the sort of um, uh, like making making some of these like um these tools which are available inside of like cad programs much more accessible by putting them on on the web um and and so just you know just sort of something i want to um yeah pick up on that you mentioned and also kind of you know something that we might discuss later when we get into some of like the analysis sections and and, and stuff like that um should I, should I jump ahead and do the next one? I think I figured out how I can I can listen in on what you guys are hearing on my computer. <laughs> um, so let's see if it works. Awesome. And I would like to show you the outcomes of the uh, I should have said before I started this one. So we've we've titled this one under uh, generative. So so projects that deal with some kind of like you know generating geometry or sites or or um, buildings or, or or anything. All right, I'll uh, I'll let it go now based data management seminar of uh, IAC and MACAD program. Today I would like to show you the uh, final project, uh, which is uh, a Grasshopper script that um, uses uh, inputs to create uh, massing and floor plans that uh, we've been developing as a group project. Basically, it takes uh, uh, the, the rooms, their areas, the connection of the rooms, and the distribution of rooms on the floors. And it uh, then takes a bounding box and it performs a space syntax collision, uh, which uh, results in the creation 
of uh, the initial massing with a few inputs that are able that we are able to change to change here you can see the smaller version of the script deployed on server where you, there are a few few things that we can change the first thing is we can show annotations so as you can see the uh, each uh, function is now annotated we can highlight the division of each annotation when the function is too big to be just one sphere. We can change the color palette. and uh, show the boundary, which is the initial massing uh, limit. We can also define the location of the vertical communication by dragging the point. At, at all the times we can change the display mode. We can also go to the floor plan generation where you can clearly see what happens when you move the point. The lift is uh, the vertical communication and it moves. It works for all the floors. Uh, extra options that are able to, that you can edit here is uh, show uh, nicer boundaries, merge clusters, show corridors, and also the coolest one is when we scale the initial area of the spheres, the whole script will update to compensate for the bigger areas. And finally, when all the algorithm is done. We can always click download Rhino file and uh, open their outcomes in Rhino, in the individual, individual Rhino. Hello everyone. My name is Krishnani Vijay Kumar. For today's presentation on cloud-based data management seminar, I'll be briefly explaining the approaches we followed throughout and going through the exercises done over the course of this semester. So we start off with exploring the basic HTML, CSS, and JavaScript functionalities. Here is a web page uh, displaying a previous module project. The page has basic functionalities such as images, links to other pages, and pop-up buttons, etc. So for the next exercise, we were asked to explore the possibility of using Rhino 3DM Loader to load 3DM files online and to exp extract and display data associated with the 3D models. So as you can see here, the models, uh, you can also uh, click on each part of the model and the data associated with that part is being displayed on the browser. And the page has other similar functionalities as before. So moving further, we were introduced to Rhino Compute and uh, here you can see a basic grasshopper definition being run on the browser. And as you move sliders, the definition is changed and the result is being displayed on, on the screen. And uh, here you have another uh, instance of Rhino compute running locally. The approach was to showcase cellular automata on the browser. So by uh, manually going through uh, different um, uh, different steps, you can we can uh, visualize the growth behavior of uh, each of these cells, as you can see right now. So uh, the initial grid points can be controlled manually here. Also, the rules for the initial step 
can also be toggled on and displayed. The setup for the initial growth can be changed from um, multiple to single regions. Also, various display modes can also be uh, be uh, toggled. So here you see the grid and also the overlay display mode. And it keeps growing based on the cellular automata algorithm that is defined on the graph of the definition. So for the final project, um, for the final project, I have here an urban block generator. The block can be uh, randomized and also the number of trees, the number of blocks, etc., can be increased or decreased. The aim was to bridge this project with the previous one to create um, an organically growing urban unit along with the trees. So finally, we uh, all were asked to in, 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 include all these projects together into one web page and where we can navigate through these different projects and also uh, change the values and uh, go through each of these. So thank you so much for listening. Well, hi, I'm Keshav Narayan. Uh, I'm an architect from India. Uh, and I took this opportunity of cloud-based data management to create my uh, portfolio website from scratch from HTML and CSS, which was a, quite a fun ride. And thanks to Will and uh, Lewis for teaching us this. And uh, so basically I've documented my six months journey in EAC and uh, primarily also documented the assignments that I've, uh, I have done in this uh, module with Will and Lewis. So I would like to focus on the final set of assignments that I've done for this course, which is the design your own Volnoi table app and the random context generator. I'm going to jump ahead to the uh, random context generator app here, which was the which was the final project submission. So there are basically the random context generator app is a uh, I mean is an app that uh, that is a solution to a problem of creating context for architectural models. Uh, so here you can create your own context by defining your own site area and also uh, drawing this major road that goes within the site. So these points can also be edited and the site point can also be edited so that uh, can be visualized in the browser. So here you can see even the, the area of each block is uh, can be visualized here. Uh, so that like we can produce uh, convincing contexts, even though with uh, with the random context generator app. So here, so here we can switch off uh, roads. We can also uh, switch off the display of the blocks. We can also we can also switch off the display of the trees. Uh, it takes quite a bit of a time to load, but meanwhile, we can see. Meanwhile, you can see the nature of visualizations that is produced produced by this app. So here, I mean, uh, so here you can also place your uh, uh, design model in this generated context, which can again be viewed in the browser. So here. So let's say let's zoom into the site specifically. And you can, uh, we can upload a model here. So right now I've uploaded a basic model. Takes time to load and see, you can see the model here. So this is the design model and the design model can also be visualized in the browser itself without any assistance. So that's uh, truly the power of this random context generator app. So you can directly export screenshots of this model and then you can view. So the other added advantage to this is that we can download uh, this model and view it in the Rhino browser and can also substitute this with a much more detailed model, which can directly be taken to rendered environments. 
So right now, let's. I have downloaded one of the models that comes from this random card center. Yeah, so here you can see how we can easily generate convincing renders. So here you can switch to Arctic. And voila, there's already a rendered model. So that's it. Thank you for listening to my presentation and thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Jonathan and today I'll be presenting my final project. It is a moon column originally coming from the studio class. And this is an aggregation system that adapts to the conditions of the terrain, allowing different forms of growth. The online project will allow the website users to generate a new settlement on the moon and to manipulate the sliders to generate different groups and to manipulate the size of the clusters. So the inputs are the terrain, the cluster size, the number of connections, the level of detail, and we will have this new moon coloring. So let's take a look. So in the Rhino and Grasshopper, with the help of Wasp, I created this, um, this file where we can, first of all, manipulate the size of the, of the terrain. We can increase the terrain scope and we can also uh, increase the amount of hills so we can create a, a terrain with a lot of uh, slope we can also increase the height of these hills and the most important thing is the that uh, now the cluster will, will have to adapt to these terrain conditions and uh, it is going to find the best way to, to settle. So the next thing that I created, it's the possibility to keep growing. So if we increase this growth, it's uh, okay. In this case, it's going to go vertically, but it can also try to find other other possibilities. And the last thing was the the level of detail, which right now we see like best base geometry, um, but we can also change it to a, a more detailed geometry. So let's take a look in the, in the website. Unfortunately, it was not possible to translate everything from the original finds since I had so uh, many troubles with uh, the size and uh, the script and, and also uh, with the plugin. So I am tried my best and I translate the, the main important features, which for example, here we can see the terrain size that is modified. And uh, we can also uh, modify the amount of hills. We can increase the amount of hills. And we can uh, change the height of of the hills and now into the clusters uh, what we can do we can uh, change the, the radius of, of the spheres and we can also create a different cluster with many many connections or less connections and uh, regarding the position i create one slider that is going to change and to Try to find another point uh, on mostly on the top of the of the hill. And this is my final project. Thank you very much. And um... all right, that was the uh, regenerative um, section. Um, yeah, Luis, I'm gonna I'm gonna steal this point that you wrote down because you wrote it down as I was thinking about it, um, and I uh, based off on what I said, um, what I mentioned earlier before we started this 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 part about um, you know making tools more accessible to people, making them more easily used, um, 
by people you know not not necessarily talking about like accessibility and um in terms of uh fairness always but making like these things actually easy to use for for anyone so, so they get used um so you might have useful tools that you've, you've built that um you put them in a place that that is very easy for people to access them i.e in a web browser then people will um will use them um and 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 then obviously there's the uh, added benefit of being able to involve people that you're you might be working directly with such as uh you know your clients your collaborators other other stakeholders um i don't know if anyone in the in the panel has had um any experience of of any kind of collaboration through you know interactive browser-based tools i mean i think i I, I think you guys do, um, but I just wonder if anyone could talk about a bit of that, that experience. Don't all go at once. I can start maybe. <laughs> all right, I'll kick it off. Um, no, for sure. I mean, I think as, as you um, point out, like, you know, you work in projects, you have, um, tons of information and you want to be able to share exactly the right information in the right time um, and obviously not too much and, and also make it as accessible as possible. Um, so that being said, also in the context of Grasshopper, um, I think we normalize, you know, the, I guess, complexity of Grasshopper and sort of programming and visual programming quite a lot. Or, you know, when you've been doing it for some time, you kind of, you know, it's just a grasshopper file. You sort of, you know, I send it to you, you open it up in Rhino, you can, you know, mess around with these sliders and you send it to someone and uh, someone has never, you know, touched grasshopper before. It's pretty intimidating, obviously, right? Um, and then you end up actually teaching them how to use grasshopper and Rhino, um, which is also, you know, a pretty, pretty good investment, obviously. Um, but, um, yeah, you know, it's 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 this is just an alternative way of of sharing information quickly. Like if you can actually publish, you know, either just sort of static 3D models, um, you know, interactive, sort of you can click on them, sort of visualize information, um, and obviously sort of filter things in in the way that, that you want. Um, but also like actually having that sort of generative component of actually using REST Hopper and and you know Rhino computes, uh, it's bringing us a lot of value because um, like. Yeah, there is always different, you know, parties involved in, in projects, right? And, and, you know, some are more sort of familiar with 3D tools and, and you know, generative design tools. Um, some people are not. So it's, 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 um, it's, you know, a huge opportunity to share um, information um, in, in, in a pretty simple and convenient way. It's also like, you know, if, if you, if you, um, um, if you have some, some more senior folks in, in your project team, which you probably do, right? Um, it could also be that they have to show information to their clients, maybe on site or whatever. Uh, to be able to do that from you know phone or an iPad is also bringing us uh, quite a lot of, lot of um, you know uh, value. Um, so yeah, it's it's um, it's extremely valuable. Awesome, awesome. Thank thank you for that. I think yeah, you touched on something with the mention of the senior uh, people because I know that when I, when I worked as a as an engineer, one of the one of the sort of key problems that people were trying to solve all the time is how do you how do you demonstrate all this like um, uh, this this inbuilt knowledge that a a, a firm has 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 you know curated o o over time and all of the the skills and some of those things can be kind of you know encoded as you know al algorithms you know for like best practices or, or or something but how do you demonstrate that 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 knowledge in particular how do you how would you demonstrate it to a to, to to an outsider, to a to a client or an external collaborator when you don't necessarily want to, you know, show them the code, um, but you want to show them, you know, that you have this uh, um, ability, um, you know, in a way that people beginning to understand a bit better now, you know, they want to see something that they can touch on on, on the web and on those things. So I think it's really, yeah, it's definitely a really crucial direction that architecture and engineering and design is is is, is moving on uh, moving in yeah 
Um, I also just wanted to add a little bit to that and just kind of <clears throat> on the accessibility thing, like I feel like um, obviously it is really important that more like engineers, I'm talking from an engineering point of view, so that's where I'm coming from. Uh, the more engineers are learning more about Grasshopper and Dynamo, and then some more people are able to like take definitions or like Dynamo scripts other people are using, kind of expand on them, debug them themselves. But there will always be like, there will always be like a need for like very complex scripts and like for something like generative stuff like it's not really feasible for like every engineer to be able to like have a level of computational like knowledge to be able to kind of take these and adapt these very like huge spaghetti code things and be able to adapt them to their specific projects or use case so i feel like being able to like have a small team of people focus on those kinds of like very big applications or projects or scripts or something like that and being able to put it in a place like on the web that other people are be will be able to use more easily like i feel like that's just so important because it like kind of opens up this uh, efficiency gain and this sort of like you know future of uh, our discipline and opens it up to all engineers and like all disciplines and makes that just um kind of brings us all forward you know so i think it's really key to be able to do something like this Absolutely, absolutely. I think, yeah, you, you mentioned some key points there that I think were touched on when we were talking about, um, you know, the size of geometry that's being sent around. Sometimes these, um, you know, these algorithms uh, are just too complex um, to be run in a kind of um, uh, a reasonable amount of time um, to to be usable in some in some contexts. Um, and and so there's always that and then and then there's also also the just because it's easy to push a button doesn't necessarily mean it's easy to understand the output that you're get you're getting um so there are those those those, those caveats but in general it's it's probably better that um we have fewer gatekeepers um kind of controlling access to 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 these things also because those people need to take a holiday right so someone else can uh, take the reins Another thing that reminded me, I just want to kind of put out there that for other people like developing this kind of stuff, like the thing about people like not wanting to press a button and get an outcome and not be able to trust it, like being able to create these applications, but also have good documentation or have some sort of like output that like documents what the tool is doing and like why you're getting that result is also very important because just having like an easy to use tool can be really good for you and like your colleagues, but there might be people who like won't trust this like black box to give a good result um, that they can kind of trust and keep going on with their projects. So that kind of documentation is really important to back up your applications. Yeah, I totally agree, actually. No, I just got to say, I totally agree. I mean, it's it's in, you know, in, in software engineering, that, that is sort of a given, like your document your code, you know, you, you have wikis, like, you know, get started stuff like that, you know, Grasshopper is like completely, <laughs> you know, it's just not part of the culture, which I think, you know, has to change, obviously, because it's still the same amount of complexity. And, you know, um, yeah, like, it's it's it, you know I'm I'm really hoping that we can see you know a shift in 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 that sort of mentality of not seeing you know grasshopper as just you know another way of 3D modeling. Well, it is generative, right? But it's it's still sort of a way of coding, and that, therefore it sort of requires obviously you know wikis and, and documentation, just as any other other programming language. Yeah, for for, for sure. I I think the like the the big difference is that in in software, as you say, it's it's just ingrained it's part of the process you know documentation testing um whereas in in engineering not that these, having users you know, having users <laughs> and being able to iterate and and tweak things you can't go back and rebuild a build well i mean people try but um in in engineering there's there's so much um uh, momentum often in in projects and um and yeah particularly I don't know from my experience in, in, in engineering, um, you know, the situation is such that you just need to keep working. You just need to keep doing more and more projects. And there's often not time to go back and um, even stuff that you've built for a previous project to even um, turn it into something that's reusable. So anything that you can do to improve that process of making it reusable and, and um, making it easy to document uh, can only be only be a good thing. I, I can totally relate to that. And apart from the community, uh, from apart from the documentation, the community is very important. <laughs> so whenever I had a project where it wasn't really done before, it's not going to be in the documentation. So you have to reach out to to you. <laughs> 
and, and ask for any uh, future uh, features and anything that's not currently possible, but maybe might be possible in the future. Uh, and that's that's the hardest part <laughs> where you can't base your project um, on, on some uh, examples from the Internet. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. I mean, in our internal culture is 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 one of kind of community documentation. I I, I think, and you know, and if you can't find something, ask for it. And um, that's obviously sometimes hard to translate into the sort of often sort of closed off um, way that engineering and architecture firms work. Just because they, you know, they, they they've got a lot of like IP to 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 protect and and, and things like this. Um, but yeah, all right, that was really interesting. Um, I guess we should jump on to the to to, to the next one. So next up, um, uh, the final. Um, so I have one more one more group. I did just post the um, like a rough schedule in the which we're I mean we're already behind. Um, go figure. Uh, in 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 the chats for the final um, group, we've got four more. Um, four more videos, um, loosely based around uh, configurators. Um, but still under the kind of broad umbrella of, of, of architecture. Um, all right. Hi, this is Kim. Uh, today I'm going to present my final project uh, for the data management. So the intention of the project was to um, have a um, sun hour uh, study system on the web um, then people can discuss together um, by moving the points and um, also um, they can see directly different uh, most um, as most exposed to the to the sun um, so the script of the grasshopper was created by two different uh, geometry there are not only a mesh or but also there are curves that represent um, uh, structure. However, um, I, couldn't, I couldn't solve the problem of the um, uh, script. Uh, I tried to ma make, make a script by um, referencing the, the example of dresser, <clears throat> but I couldn't, there was um, a serious problem. Uh, a lot of errors uh, came up, so I couldn't, I couldn't solve doubt uh, for uh, four hours, six hours. Um, so this is my final project, which is very simple. Um, so we can move um, the points like that, and then geometry is adapt directly depending on the the location of the point. So, but also we can change the. Um, um, size radius of the dome but it's kind of heavy so I try to be careful um, this is too big sorry um, and then also we can change the um, limit area so it change it gives more uh, dynamic uh, shape uh, of the dome so it was very interesting um, class uh, to know um, to test our grasshopper um, script and then and then testing on the web, but um, it requires it seems like it requires a lot of knowledge basic knowledge of uh, scripting. Uh, I think it's very crucial because uh, we spend a, a lot of time to to find a solution but we didn't know how so spent a lose, lose a lot of time um but thanks to <clears throat> will and Luis, we catch up to well thank you is the sound coming through all right for you, for you guys yeah it's perfect yeah, my computer's uh, an enigma. Um, just give me two seconds to try a couple of things. Hi, this is a presentation of the final project from of Alex. 
just that you want, might wonder what this is on the screen. This is uh, our space farm from the studio project from Group 7 uh, with Neil Pan, uh, Dong Yap and myself. And the building, uh, the space farm are made up of individuals and modules, each with uh, an underground interior and an inner shell and an outer shell to protect against um, the hostile environment on the moon. And each of one, if of each of us uh, uh, took on to design uh, each of these elements and the idea to have uh, something like this very simple almost diagrammatic presentation of the building is that uh, a couple of weeks ago we start to have quite different understanding uh, on how our modules should fit on the terrain of the moon and we didn't realize that actually it's we are actually on a, the building has to sit on a very steep slope uh, that's sloping on both sides. So with this simple representation of our building, uh, you can change the um, slide to change the relative size of the modules. And And the way um, the tilting of the of the terrain that uh, affect the um, arrangement of the modules and how they can be connected, and at last the height of the building, and perhaps the more important, uh, we we'll, we want to understand the space in between the inner shell and the outer shell, and whether. Uh, and also the with the underground interior. And for the last couple of days, I did try to add some color and material to this uh, models. I thought it would be quite easy with all this uh, example from 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 you, but uh, it was um, much harder than I thought. And with uh, a couple trial of copy and paste from different different script and it just didn't work so i'll leave it to next time to figure out how to make a more interesting models than a black and white version and you might also notice that uh, um, the, this final project got pushed to the apps on heroku from my previous exercise i don't know I didn't, don't know what I did. It's uh, probably some, the sequence of how I pushed the, the code seems to be wrong and all the, all the latest changes got pushed to the last. Hi everyone, I am Jaime and I'm going to show you what I've done for cloud-based data management. So we started with learning the basics of CSL, CSS, HTML or JavaScript uh, with this web page. So in our uh, project that I've done, um, then we learned how to upload models uh, onto the web with Node.js, also our own grasshopper definitions and then we upload them into the app server, into Heroku. Uh, so you can change it as you want. And uh, finally, this is my final assignment. In it, I, uh, I defined a grasshopper definition where you can uh, design your own house, your own generative house. So the idea is that you place uh, the house wherever you want and also your swimming pool uh, all over the site. And once you have uh, defined your house and the swimming pool, which uh, are not going to collide, you can design the interior, the exterior, sorry. 
so the size of the house uh, and also uh, the roof slope or the size of the swimming pool. Then once you get uh, the size of your house, you can define the exterior design, where is your entrance, the, how many windows do you have, uh, how big they are, and so on. And once you are convinced with your exterior design, you can hide the roof and go into designing the um, interior. So you get to uh, how many rooms do you want? And then generate the design of uh, the interior design that more satisfies you. <clears throat> and finally, once you you get the your house, you can download your model, open it, and build it. So um, the definition, the script that I that I've made is made so that we get the sliders in one side in the left side and the model runs uh, in a different independently in the, the right side and this is made with uh, css and html uh, splitting it into two sides and then in the javascript part I got all my inputs from Grasshopper. Uh, I wanted it to do, be done with get input, so it would be done automatically. But uh, I found that it didn't work when I set the initial points to be then dragged. So I have to change that into defining its slider uh, manually. So um, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, hope you like it and see you. Bye. Hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Hisham, and I'm presenting to you today the final presentation for digital tools for cloud cloud based data management. And the first part is a final project. Cloudscape, and the, the idea behind that project is that the user can access the, the app so we can play with the iterations to get different values and different solutions for distribution of these, of these landscape elements. The user can also uh, manipulate the land boundary using these control points and get updated for the area and, and different dimensions. And more or less, yeah, that script is somehow fixing like like yeah, how far we can go with with these points to get different different land shapes. And the next part is that we can also show annotations to know like the radius and different areas. We can also add trees. Uh, on the landscape, when we can control how many trees do we have. Uh, and the trees now are distributed along these green areas. And when we decrease that value, trees go like being more restricted to, to these areas. Or we when we increase a value, uh, the trees are more scattered somehow. We can also manipulate the, the scale of the trees. And we can manipulate the color. Of trees, so maybe we can go to more orange or red trees somehow. We also can have a tour inside the landscape elements and these trees and the water and the green areas. And also, we can manipulate the water radius. So, here's a part that we can manipulate the different zones' radius. So water and greens, so we can increase the area. Or if we even 
need to cancel one of the zones, we, we can make it zero. So now there's only, uh, there are only two green areas. And at the end of, of manipulating the script, the user can download the file to have fun with the output or all, or maybe produce uh, 2D drawings or render that part and so on. Uh, and we also here can see like a nice uh, blue background and the fog to make it more dramatic somehow when you go far or or more close to the landscape. And behind the scenes, we are using GitHub Desktop to, to create our HTML and JavaScript. Uh, so the first part is about styling and reading different inputs and different uh, actions and calling 3GS, Rhino Compute, Rhino Loader, Line3DM. And we are also calling the Grasshopper file. Uh, we're also, uh, this part is concern, concerning generating uh, the starting uh, control points on the app and different parts for calling the uploads from the grasshopper definition, creating the cameras and the clouds and controlling the shadow of, of the scene and controlling the camera position and computing the whole script. And the other part behind the scene is a Rhino and the grasshopper definition. So uh, this is a, like the list of the inputs and uh, these parts are regarding like generating uh, different areas and using kangaroo can variables to make sure that okay i'm just gonna stop that one there uh, just try and keep things somewhat somewhat fair um i don't know if luis if you have some um some thoughts when i start off the discussion sure i mean um here we saw a series of videos that show kind of give access to this sort of landscape of options. Um, and I found that, you know, when I was working as an architect, you know, I found this way of working really, really interesting and liberating, but I found that many clients did not. <laughs> so you, you have to find, you know, the, the right client that's willing to kind of go on this journey of co-creation with you because otherwise, you know, People aren't used to uh, seeing options. They want, you know, uh, they want you to deliver, you know, three things. They want to know the metrics of these things and, you know, choose from one of these. But here, you, you know, depending on how you discretize the, you know, each each parameter, you have, you know, a, an unmanageable number of options. Um, so, you know, what's what's too much? Uh, you know, what's too much access? What's too little access and how do you how do you decide you know and, and how do you i don't know what's the there's a fine line between like you know co-creation and and giving everything away um so yeah i mean i guess that's that's that that was my my uh my impression i think the idea of of having access to options um is is becoming something a little bit more accepted um, but still, I think we're a long way away from you know handing a client a tool and 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 they create you know they they de they designing uh, part of the project along with us. I think that relationship still isn't something that is a very comfortable one. I don't know what uh, what our panel thinks about this. Yes, totally. Uh, catering to the right kind of customer is very important, and the user experience and, and the rule uh, less is more. Uh, but also allowing a fairly amount of uh, design that um, I, I think it's the right place for for like mass mass customization, where um, there is a certain choice of uh, options, but they don't actually change the design completely, and uh, also showing good uh, presets to give uh, an idea to the customers what's possible and where they can uh, give their input. That's very important. Uh, I struggle with that every single day because uh, my company's customers are um, anyone from architects, designers to um, like salespeople or people who has, have never dealt with anything 3D. So um, you, you have to really focus on user experience and making the interface as simple as possible um, so they can just focus on um, creating a design that they want. Uh, 
Uh, totally, yeah. To add on to that a bit, I feel like, um, as Will was saying, like super client dependent. And one thing that I found within when I was working as an engineer within a quite a large company, working with very large clients, was that like one fear that the engineering company actually had was that like giving too much away to the client would kind of devalue the work that we were doing. And there was this sort of like weird tension between like creating a very open and like flexible tool that everyone can use together versus like kind of making our jobs seem easier than they are. And then kind of like struggling with how we start to cost um, projects as like we bring in more and more of these tools. Um, so I guess one thing that we tended to do with large clients was not really give the full thing and kind of have like, um, like you were just saying, have like certain options. So like we sort of use the majority of tool and kind of use the tool within ourselves to kind of um, ideate and brainstorm together and then come up with like a collection of presets or a collection of options within um, to kind of give the client like a sense of control and sense of contribution without sort of like exposing all our tools to like clients who might see that and sort of devalue our work because of it. So I think very client dependent, but yeah, that's sort of how we dealt with it. Yeah, on that, um, uh, as you say, as you like, you want to be uh, protective over what you're sharing to, to the clients, but what's happening quite often behind the scenes is you know, as Bazia mentioned before, you're, you're, you're building on top of work that you've maybe found on forums, you know, or you've gotten help through the community or you're, you're, um, you're using open source tools or you're, you've implemented algorithms that you've read in uh, papers that people have, you know, shared at, at conferences. So it's, it's a kind of like a weird dichotomy there. Um, yeah, just wanted to bring that up for, sort of, for some perspective in in all of that as well not to say that everything's broken in engineering <laughs> but, uh, we, it's just something that um, I think you get a bit more of a uh, you see more being at this end of like the kind of tool mm -hmm. building end of the spectrum yeah and I feel like maybe this is probably something that we can do better as as engineers within other companies is to sort of like shift the mentality. Um, like I work at Speckle and Speckle is an open source tool. And like at a couple of firms previously, like people have this very negative association with open source, either being low quality or that like we can't really trust it, it's not secure. And also like being hesitant to open source any of their own tools because they're like, oh, why would we give it away for free when that's like not really, that's not the point, you know, like we're building on top of each other's work and like everything in a sense should like being open kind of helps everyone because all the tools become better and we can build them on top of each other. Um, so kind of shifting that mentality within engineering companies, I think is also really important as well as kind of furthering it in our side of like in our little um, sphere of super computational and um, digital stuff. Absolutely, I can I can totally relate to uh, so many points mentioned here. Um, you know, both in terms of like the open source stuff, but also um, design options and you know what do you actually present to uh, to the client. And as as I mentioned, like you know what we usually do is we you know we internally want to see all those thousand different options. Like when we design things, we want to have like the full suite of um, you know data sets to be able to sort of you know, filter and sort of understand what's going on. Uh, how can we improve this? Um, but then what we present to clients is usually, you know, three or four different options that are sort of pre, um, you know, pre-filtered really. Um, so we can really set up the discussion from a fair point. And uh, yeah, cause like, as, as mentioned, like you can really, you know, go down some 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 nasty rabbit holes uh, <laughs> with, with clients that you probably don't wanna, you know, go anyway. So um, yeah, it's very important. Um, yeah, I don't know how are we doing on time, Will. I think it's uh, almost time for a bit of a break. We are, I mean, we're we're what an hour and thirty five minutes in, um, and we're about halfway. Um, I think take a uh, let's say a 10, 10 minute break. Um, time to time to get get the kettle on and. Uh, yeah, and then we've got another three, three, three groups work to go through. Cool. All right. Great. Thanks so much. See you uh, back at ten, ten two. Yeah. Sounds good. Sounds All right. Good. All right.
think we'll get going again and uh, give people maybe a, a minute to uh, saunter back in. For those of you wondering, this is what it takes for me to be able to hear what you guys are hearing from my computer. It only took one trip to the garage. True engineer. Absolutely. It's something, it's something weird about um, uh, Bluetooth headsets um, actually have like two different settings, one for like video conferencing and one for actually listening to sound and zoom hogs one or the other I don't, I, yeah i don't know but but yeah the old school all right um i just wanted to say i need to drop off great work everywhere everyone um it's been a pleasure to see all of the nice projects thank you so much, much for making it us, yeah really appreciate your comments thanks a lot take care you too. I, I, I'll I'll just uh, yeah log out in nine minutes. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. Okay. So shall we move to the what are we looking at now? The product configurator. Product configurators. All right. Yeah. All right. I'll get this. I'll get this going. Hello everyone. Welcome to the final presentation for cloud management seminar. I am Sachin and I'll start my presentation with a very quick introduction um, about all the works that have been produced in, the, in this course. The very first project which I worked on was an article that was produced in HTML. The second project uh, include, included uh, producing an interior model over Rhino and then taking it on 3JS on the web. Third project, uh, it included creating a grasshopper script um, and then uploading it uh, using Rhino compute. Uh, so what I did here was create a very random uh, series of trees and blocks around it, um, which can be used for interactivity. The fourth one was creating a geometry and uh, adding various parameters to it and then taking it to Heroku um, over the web again. And then the final project which I worked on is designing the VAS for 3D printing. So here's my project. Uh, the idea behind the project is to create a very neat, very clean um, interface, uh, which can be understood by almost everyone. And uh, people can uh, create different kinds of geometries using these four parameters. So the very first, parameter which I defined is the density, the density of the material, um, which changes, which can be changed over here uh, using these inputs. And then the second one, radius and height and rotation are obvious ones. So as you can see, the, um, the local server works quite fast. And we can create almost like very different kinds of geometries. One thing which I couldn't figure out yet is how to bring the graph mapper from Grasshopper uh, into the into the web interface because that that would help me to create uh, a lot more explorations in geometry. So I have a three D print uh, on uh, geometry here as well, which works with all the parameters, and then one can obviously download the model from here and take it for 3D printing. So in terms of issues, the only issue which I found was sometimes the server wasn't working well and it's really hard to understand whether it's your system and your code which is not working uh, or is it the server? Um, yeah, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Sumer and I'll be presenting my final outcomes from the cloud data management class, uh, class of 2021 uh, at IAC MACAD taught by Will Pearson and Luis Faguardo. 
Um, so this is a, a designs for a hypothetical lighting design company that would send its designs to the clients where they could parametrically control uh, the dimensions. Uh, so on here, for example, you can see as the width increases, the number of uh, lighting sources also increases um, and the colors can also be changed around to see what suits the client and what they would want to, uh, um, to use and then send back to us uh, the manufacturer in order for them to, uh, uh, to make it for the client. One thing I want to notice uh, while I've selected the second design here from a drop down list, which is actually a second grasshopper script, uh, I just want to point out that the base is uh, uh, it's changing or it's pulsing because of a point light which is rotating uh, within the interface. Uh, and this is the, the second design where, uh, again, it's a chandelier version of, uh, of uh, a lighting design um, and the dimensions can be changed. For example, the number of divisions of this hyperboloid can be changed. Uh, the body color can be changed in terms of you know, uh, playing with the RGB values and then the same thing, client can download this, uh, send it back to the manufacturer for the manufacturer to, to design and make for them. Um, I also played around with the, the same design using mesh normals, which is what I actually started with before I started embedding colors inside the grasshopper environment. Um, and then I also wanted to push the capabilities of the 3JS platform and I started playing with reflective surfaces and more rotational point lights um, in order to create a more dynamic environment. Uh, something I'd like to uh, do moving forward with this uh, technique is to use the HDRI environments for a more immersive experience and then also being able to apply uh, different materials to the components of these uh, lighting fixtures. Um, and then of course, adding more lighting fixture designs to this interface. These are some of my outcomes in my gallery from uh, the beginning of the class. This was our first assignment where I took uh, a singular uh, image. Uh, so this is one image and I subdivided it uh, into frames and as you hover over the frames it tells you what the objects are. This is the same uh, thing but in 3D where when you click on the objects it tells you what the name is. Uh, this was using uh, using sliders based on input and output values in Grasshopper where I tested this with subdivision of uh, a cube uh, for fractals using all native components in Grasshopper and then also playing with transparencies and mesh normals. Uh, this was the same thing, just pushing the form a little bit more and then also embedding my final outcomes. Overall, I've learned a great deal in this class and I hope to continue using this uh, in other courses and then also in my professional career. Thank you very much. So about my final project. A few years ago, I used to design some pieces of 3D printed jewelry just for fun with PLA plastic. And when my son was to be born, we had the idea to record the sound of the room to capture his first cry. After that, I kept thinking what to do with that audio file, and I decided to use the data extracting the frequency as point inputs and linking it to a geometry via Grasshopper to generate a 3D printable geometry. I did it in a very archaic solution with the Firefly plugin in a microphone playing the audio because I did not have the ability to input an audio file and extract the data inside Grasshopper. So when I first heard about the app server, I remember the project and the desire to share the ability to transform audio data into a piece of design you could wear on yourself and would also mean something with a non-architect came as the idea for the final project. Uh, so we uh, are able to use a JavaScript interface called Audio Context and add the analyzer node it has uh, to extract the current waveform or time domain into an array. That's what we do here in this window on load function. And then later this information is transformed into X, Y, and Z points and pushed into the list of points. Then we call compute and and it sends the points via JSON as a post request, streamified, and waits for the results. Grasshopper, in his side, uh, via App Server, gets the points which were here, but I created a mocked list just so we have an example here. Uh, gets the point in a create an ops curve in between the points rebuilds this curve, analyze the closest point uh, to the curve, and create mini curves in between these points, these 
two points, understands the length. And here is where the necklace first time first appears with his shape. Uh, I created these two two lines that serve as a basis, creating frames. I project the same mini curves from my points into these curves. So I have these two results and create new curves in between them, uh, new nerve curves, and then twin curves in between all of them to create this shape. And then basically what this groups does is to create the 3D shape with giving thickness to each one of the rows. And here we, in the end, I just mirror so you can get both sides of your necklace and we send it to the observer again uh, using a Draco decoding to stringify and receive the mesh in the output. So basically the app looks like this, the SoundMe necklace, you choose a file from your own, uh, the WAV file and it automatically starts playing and once you pause, it sends the data and waits until you get the meshes. Here they are coming. Your own necklace made by the sound. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, very excited to present to you the Eric Dickman uh, generator. So in this final exercise, um, I decided to, to take um, inspiration from uh, Eric Dickman, who was a designer from the Habao House, and he did this chair profile that I found really interesting because it, 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 the, quality, the parametric qualities of them are very uh, obvious. And so I thought maybe I can do some kind of homage. Um, and at the same time, as I'm paying my respect, I'm kind of bringing this, his design uh, into the 20, 2021 uh, year. So the philosophy here for this exercise is really to think about the fabrication method first. And that method can be used to construct a range of, of different things. So in the end, what I'm actually designing is, is an interface to interact with a construction system. It can produce a chair like it does here, but it could also be, you know, be producing a house. Uh, the design part is now open for the user. And uh, I think the trick is uh, if we give the broader audience more than just a blank page, you'll have a much better experience uh, finding out uh, their own personal result. So let me give you a demo of how this is working. This is the app. Um, so the idea here is that you can, uh, you can choose a design. I, I limited myself to only four, which, which um, correspond to different uh, uh, styles of his designs. So you can ju just choose one of those. Uh, it, will, it will point to a specific list in, um, in 3GS, which then is sent to Grasshopper. Uh, so the idea is that you load the design you want, and then you can you can actually start uh, you know start tweaking start tweaking the chair. You'll get a live update of the geometry, how it's looking like, and at the same time you get a number of sections that you need both for the seating and for the arms, with uh, some dimensions which are obviously not uh, ideal like this, but you get the sense of how much, uh, how many, how many, what's the area you're going to need to, to build this. Uh, then you can also, you know, decide on uh, if it's a long chair, if it's a small chair. Sorry, this is the one length of the seat. Uh, and of course, you can also tweak the, um, the sections depending on the kind of wood you, you are thinking about using. Um, yeah, and uh, after you're done, I mean, after you're, you're done tweaking around with your, um, with your design, so like I like this one, and I'm happy with the result. Um, I can just uh, oh, this is a really crazy one. Click download, and we'll to give you the um, the Rhino file with um, with exactly the design that you you just made. So you can take this and uh, send it to fabrication this for a CNC cutter, for example. Ah, uh, thank you. Hello, my name is. Awesome. Um, 
Yeah, I, I think there's a really interesting um, uh, section here, and I just made some some notes as we were, as, as we were watching. Um, that I think there's a really interesting exploration of uh, of interaction um, in this in in this group. Um, you know, we're, we're talking. We begin looking at the um, with with sessions looking at the the questioning how how we could bring in like the graph mapper. Um, in people who, who aren't necessarily um, grasshopper uh, fluent, which I'm sure is everyone everyone here. But you know, uh, how do you um, have a like an uh, an editable equation? Um, well, an interactive equation editor. How do you bring that into into um, a web um, interface? Uh, then Simir is looking at the. Um, you know, uh, switching between multiple grasshopper definitions and visualizing the the outcome in in the context, um, and manipulating the the scene to get you know different um, um, different different ideas. Uh, Barbara is looking at audio as as an input, a very different um, uh, method of of, of interaction, um, and and then finally, um, uh, I think the the idea of this 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 in the in, in the last video the mi the mix of the like documentation and the interaction like um and the 3d visualization like all in one model was a really interesting exploration um so i want to kind of like start a a bit of a discussion about the um i think there's there's something very um that has to be very deliberate here in the way that you take the thing that you've, you know, the logic you've created in, in, in Grasshopper and bring it in, in, into the web. And the web gives you all of these tools to think about structure and style. Um, and, and you need to, at the moment, you need to use those tools to be deliberate about how you, how you create something that people can interact with and how you, how you decide that they're going to um, interact with it in 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 Rhino and Grasshopper. You've kind of got free reign, um, but here we can be very very um, deliberate. I mean, often we can. Um, I know a lot of the code that, that Luis and I have written helps to bring the output in um, in a kind of streamlined and automated automated way. You know, we can bring materials and things through from from Rhino into 3GS and and rebuild. You know, using vertex colors and all those things. And you don't often have to do a lot on that end, but you do have to think a lot about the inputs and and just as a kind of like an um, open ended question to tack onto this as well, because this requires writing code. Um, and as part of this course, Lewis and I provided like a lot of uh, examples and like snippets and things so that people could like compose things um, together and didn't have to write anything from 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 scratch. But but what you know, is there a role for Software development in modern architecture and 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 engineering. So yeah, who wants to who wants to take that? I think that is a super interesting question. I mean, I think we've seen well many things here, but uh, you can I guess categorize or one way of categorizing it would be like you have sort of um, you know, apps that are sort of project specific. Like you know we we've seen you know projects. Um, um, or like apps that sort of generate geometry related to projects, and you can sort of configure these um, apps and the input for the apps to generate different sort of design options. And it gives you these like super interesting, um, you know, dynamic tools that you can really use to sort of explore your projects. But the other one, which we've been seeing in this session, I guess, is more sort of kind of uh, product configurators, right? Uh, which is also super interesting. And that sort of brings us to another um, or potentially another sort of category of uh, um, things, right? Like if you can actually use these tools to design products and sort of create product configurators, then that could potentially open up um, interesting opportunities that extend sort of beyond architecture that is sort of product design. And I mean, there are startups doing this like full time. Um, obviously had like Shape Diver, we've been working on a system called Swarm. Um, I think there was another one pretty early on, like pre, um, Brian compute called the nervous system, which is also super cool stuff. Like actually, you know, using parametric design to, you know, allow um, users and, and customers to to um, customize their products. Um, yeah, I mean, there there 
extremely interesting opportunities here, and um, I really see some 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 interesting um, you know opportunities for for both actually, like both in terms of like architectural you know design tools, but also uh, product configurators. Yeah, that's you're really you're really right there, and and I think you make an important point that we should kind of shout out that there are, are a lot of um, existing kind of uh, uh, consultancies in in the business already who who provide these 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 services you know people like shape diver and um uh you know white lioness backend um who will provide those um software development services to um you know architecture and engineering firms to help them build out these kinds of um these these kinds of tools but i think we also see a lot of people uh engineers and architects themselves um you know just sort of trying to take on that role and and roll their own um, solutions as well. Um, oh, no, for sure, yeah, and, and, and you know, it's it's uh, in the end you have to, you know, design the experience in some way, right? And and it's mm. not given that you know some prepackaged you know uh, thing is going to do it for you. So I mean, I think there is definitely you know um, like interesting opportunities in in knowing how to actually tweak these tools and you know customize things and and really sort of build the user experience that you're going for. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, and, and architects have a um, you know an an innate ability when it comes to design as well. It's a little, it's a different kind of design, but I don't I don't want to speak for all engineers, but um, I mean I did actually take a year of architecture and I didn't do very well, so I know where my skills lie. Um, but you know the um, it, it's it's something that's very interesting to to explore how how the user should use your 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 tool and how you make it obvious that they should use it in that way totally and i think seeing um seeing this particular group of stuff that like wasn't entirely architecture related that sort of branched out i thought it was very interesting to see like different contexts for this kind of stuff and what you were saying about like uh will about having like different components that you can piece together i feel like that's sort of um that's that's like a really interesting kind of approach to these kinds of tools because um, like Emil was saying, there's not always gonna be like one package solution that's going to solve your problem entirely um, because like we're opinionated, we write our applications with a certain use case in mind and that's not always gonna work for all all users um, and this sort of goes back to the open source thing but like if we have more like smaller tools that do like particular things really well then like that empowers engineers and architects and product designers and whoever else to like put these like kind of get outputs from specific tools and put them together to create something bigger and create what whatever their vision is um, this sort of like seeing this reminded me of like my I have a background in automotives and like having tools um, for example for like suspension design for chassis optimization and then for body work like if you had three Separate tools to sort of get outputs from as someone with an engineer with an engineering background but not the programming background if you were able to like leverage tools like that and put something together like that kind of that's sort of the ideal you know like you get to customize your output without having to know the, the behind the scenes of every single tool you're using because you can piece certain things together yeah i mean you know oh, will your you're muted. Yeah, I was sorry. I was talking to myself. Go ahead. No, yeah, I mean, I agree that, you know, we we know Grasshopper has limitations. I mean, like for example, the 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 project with audio and jewelry. I mean, yes, you can uh, do something with audio and, and Grasshopper, but it, is, does it make the most sense to do it there, where there's you know these great APIs in other places to to make that work? Just uh, so much more straightforward. Um, of course, you know, then you have separations of concerns, pieces in different places, but um, I think the fact that uh, the participants started to realize that, okay, yeah, there's lots we can do here, uh, and, you know, we can go, we can get a lot done within, you know, Grasshopper itself, but, you know, what, what else is out there? How can, how can we enrich this whole experience with uh, using, let's say, the, the, the right tool for the, for the scenario? Yeah, there was a lot of discussion um... Uh, kind of at the, the beginning of the, um, the sort of final project portion of this course about what plugins the, the, they'll be able to use, you know, what plugins will be on the on, on the server. And, and, and a lot of them, you know, we use this as an opportunity to, to do some testing 
and and get some of the plugins installed. But there's also sometimes the the plugins. I, I know um, so uh, Kim for, from earlier in the um, in 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 the session. Um, you know, was thinking just as an example was was thinking about using um, something like Firefly to have some kind of interaction with our Arduino's or or something, which is a really interesting um, idea. But you have to think about the how some of these plugins um, work in the context of um, a like a headless server running um, in the cloud somewhere. I still want to I still want to see that that idea realized because I think there's something really cool there. Um, but yeah. It's um, yeah, so audio input just made more sense to put that put that into the uh, JavaScript. Okay, so I jump into the next next session. Cool, we could we could talk about this stuff forever, or maybe that's just my 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 problem. I could talk forever. Hello, my name is Alexandra Jastrzemska, and I am going to present my final project for the digital tools for cloud-based data management. So my final, uh, final project was, um, was based on my previous assignment. Uh, that was the parametric trust um, done in Grasshopper script. And then for the final presentation, I took it further and created a Caramba analysis file. So here is the, um, the final project. And you can see uh, a truss in here. And um, in here, you can see the of the input parameters that we can give to the script. And first, we can change the geometry of the truss. And for example, we can change the length of the truss. And it will update. And then we can change the number of divisions of the diagonals in the truss. We can change it to four, or we can have uh, more divisions in the truss. Another parameter that we can change is the initial height. So it's the height at the edge. We can change it to be uh, higher or lower. And then uh, another parameter is the uh, offset of the uh, middle point, um, which can be uh, also manipulated. And the initial height can be also zero. So then when we have the, uh, the geometry, uh, we can also set up the cross section of the elements and we can uh, choose from the CHS uh, cross sections. And we can change it for the bottom and top chord and also for the diagonals. The next thing it would be uh, to set up the uniform line node which be, that will be applied to the top chord of the truss and we can change the um, value of the load in the slide in here. So then when everything is ready for analysis, we can show the, uh, the final mesh as an output from uh, the Grasshopper script. And another output from the script is the maximum actual force and the maximum utilization. And when we, uh, when we change the uh, geometry parameters, um, the, the analysis will update um, accordingly. And we can see the uh, the compression and tension uh, mesh. So we can see that when we change the all the parameters, uh, we can preview if the utilization is below or um, bigger than one hundred percent, and the color of the um, of the slide will tell us if this is um, um, right or wrong. And here you can see my uh, project gallery for the uh, for the uh, seminar, and you can go and check out my other projects. Thank you. Hi everyone. I'm going to present my final assignment for uh, this class. It's called the last tower and the first roof. Um, and the idea behind the project was to create an urban scene where the different parameters um, of the design could uh, generate a real-time output on the um, direct sunlight analysis. Uh, so I created um, two, uh, two elements, uh, which they can um, be configured in different ways, um, the tower and the roof. 
um, the tower uh, changes in um, in floor in floor height, um, the number of floors, uh, and also the uh, rotation from zero to ninety degrees. Um, the roof uh, it's it changed in in size. Um, where the, vo the the space in the center uh, becomes bigger or um, or smaller, and also uh, the shape it it creates different shapes um, that can uh, output um, different uh, sun analysis. Um, I also have created an option to um, turn off the uh, sun study. So the model gets, um, it generates uh, easier um, different setups and we can decide each one we want to analyze. Um, when the, the sun, the sun uh, studies are, are on, then we can actually, um, it's not static, so we actually can analyze uh, all the different uh, months of the year. Um, with with the option for uh, four days uh, per month, um, it's uh, it's it's interesting to to see um, how actually um, we can also perceive uh, how the, the the ground floor interacts with the um, with the with the sun analysis. And how actually that can or or not uh, develop options to uh, to design. Uh, we have also the option to uh, download, and I think uh, that's the end of the presentation. Thank you so much. I hope you have enjoyed. Good morning. Good afternoon. My name is Herman Bodenbender, and welcome to the final presentation that I prepare for this digital tools for cloud-based data management seminar. This project I created Lunar, that is a website done uh, with HTML and JavaScript and the Heroku app, and which and I created a different series of exercises um, that we took all the learnings from the seminar and we tried to put it into three different explorations. So as you can see here, this is the website I've created. Um, it's called Lunar. And then if you start scrolling down, um, this is, this is the, the presentation of the different projects. And the very first project that I created, I call it Lunar Picnic. Um, that if you go into it and if you click here, you will see that it opens the side of the website. Um, so the idea in this one is a little bit of a kind of parody that we actually do in a lot of the projects on the moon for the studio scenario. So in here, I play with the idea of actually creating like a, like a lunar picnic with your drones um, that funny enough, they can fly on the moon. But this, uh, this is a grasshopper script that is running using Kangaroo as well as Ladybug. And as you can see here on the left, you've got your different inputs. So for the ones that, you know, Kangaroo, you can start playing with the length and the strength um, of the physics of the scenario. So this will actually adapt. And as you can see here, you can also modify the slider of the terrain generator that actually creates a random uh, series of points and how your scenario adapts. And then just to make sure that the radiation doesn't uh, doesn't cook your life, and you can actually just enable the radiation analysis. And now it's running Ladybug, uh, and it's checking the amount of hours. Um, so as you can see here, you can also change the time, the sun position that is being placed based on the southern hemisphere of the moon. And then as you can see here, we uh, we got a projection on the surface based on the sun position and the amount of hours. You can also color, change the color of the legend to your preference based on the different options that Ladybug gave us. So this is a more traditional one approach and you can play with it. Um, then if you go to back to the main page, then we're gonna go back to a, a second exercise that I created that I call it Lunar Space Residency. Um, that for the Lunar Space Residency is more in line with the, what we did for the studio project that we use WASP to create a discrete aggregation of different components. And as you can see here, you can modify the position of the starting point of the aggregation based on the lunar surface of the Shackleton crater. And then you can also, at the same time, it's also running Ladybug, as you can see there. You can modify the amount of parts you have in the aggregation, the density, and the different time of the day as well. 
and similar to the previous example you can also change the legend to whatever color you want um, but in essence it's still running the the radiation on the process as you can see here and then if you go back to the, in the main page on a final assignment a final exercise that i did is the parametric tower but if you click on this one as you can see you know going more architecturally we cannot omit the famous tower and of course you know our most beautiful rotation parameter that we as architects we always like to do i mean here we can play with the different densities and lengths and ratios and then we can also have a facade recess that allow us to either get a flash uh, facade on it or actually have a mode like that and then after that we can of course run the radiation analysis as well using ladybug that will tell us the sun position this is based on south africa and exposure that the facade actually has to it in the different scenarios um, and then if you go back now to the main page and i really cover the, the three exercises of the final project that i create you can actually keep scrolling and you can see the other assignments that i have created i'm going to jump ahead to the next one which i don't have in this um in this playlist unfortunately give me one second okay maybe five seconds short video to present the work that I did for the data management class. So we started off by adding an image and then having some text displayed once you hover over the image. And then we added a 3D model so that we could visualize it in the in the browser. And then the third task that we had was to actually add a 3D model, which had some embedded uh, data for to the geometry. So this is an example where I had the, the model which had certain uh, uh, data embedded in, in, in different categories, for example, over here, the material, the type. And then this is uh, my final project. It's uh, a pavilion that I did. Uh, I decided to use the, um, to just make a simple pavilion. So we can see that the pavilion is is, is flexible. You could actually uh, change the size of the pavilion. So yeah, you could see it, um, it changed in size. And then you could change the number of panels. For example, you could increase the number of panels or decrease it, whatever you like. So maybe we could decrease it right now. So yeah, you could see that the size has changed. And then we could uh, randomize the arrangement uh, of the panels so it's a simple change not anything major and then you could also uh, you can also notice that there are attractors over there points that are attracting this geometry you could change the attractors uh, randomly to be honest uh, using just this slider for example you can see it changed over here and then you could uh, these trees you could change the starting point of these trees to go up a bit or down a bit but uh, it's just a static it does not affect the simulation in any way and then we could uh, change the panel height. So for example, this is like the highest panel, this is the smallest panel. We could change these values. And we could also change the maximum size of the panel. So this is like the, the smallest panel and this is the largest panel. We could actually uh, change these values, right? For example, uh, let's... And you can see the, the panels have changed in size. And then we could run a solar analysis. As you can see, it, uh, it ran the analysis for a specific day and a specific month over the year. And you can see this is the result that it uh, it has. If you change the size of the panels it will, and the arrangement of the, the panels, for example, changing the attractors and the size and uh, other features, you'll find that these will change as well. And you can also uh, turn it into a shadow study. This is just by simply changing the legend. And then you could overall run a uh, radiation analysis as well. And you can see the, the number of uh, the average sunlight hours are uh, over here presented uh, as 12.628 and this allows you to compare between different uh, different options and you can see over here we did a radiation analysis and uh, you can see the total radiation is presented over here and you can see the uh, the average uh, radiation as well in kilowatt hours per meter square and after that you could actually change the uh, month and day that you're operating on and you could later on 
download your own uh, force pavilion, so, which you feel has actually achieved the best results when it comes to shading and uh, sunlight hours. So yeah, that, that's uh, that's pretty much it. Um, thank you. Awesome. Um, yeah, I think we're probably well um, positioned to discuss this particular group, given that we're somewhat uh, engineer heavy on the um, uh, on on the panel. I don't know, Louis. Do you do you have anything from a uh, um, you know architect's per perspective? Yeah, I mean, um, it's. I think you guys, uh, engineers, must think uh, architects are pretty funny. You know, we, we've, at least in my my architectural career, you know, went from, you know, having Ecotect as like this super accessible, kind of weird to use, but just amazing uh, tool at the time. And then you could plug in like wind analysis and that was like crazy because you had to like, it was expired. So you had to change the clock on your machine to be able to make it run. Uh, and now you have, you know, the ladybug tools project, you know, having pollination cloud, a lot more of these um, APIs coming online, you know, the work that has been done in uh, TT Core uh, to get those tools online, Hypar, Speckle, you know. So we're as as all of the as we're we're getting more used to having interfaces online. A lot of these APIs are also kind of uh, also there to uh, to join to join the conversation, which is which is really interesting. And that was my that was my perspective. I mean, there's, I think there's a lot of assumptions when architects use uh, analysis tools. Um, so I'm glad that the, these APIs are also coming along to the browser so that we can assume less and lean on the expertise of engineers uh, in all, whether on the desktop or in the cloud. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting aspect of the <laughs> this accessibility that we, we talk about, actually. Um, I, I, I remember um, I remember working with um, an, an architect at uh, HOK who he 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 said he wanted to share grasshopper models and, and he started sort of playing around with the um, uh, he said he wanted wanted to understand how Caramba works um, and and this turned out to be an amazing thing um, and we collaborated on a, a really cool project and we worked you know seamlessly and and I was trying to understand a bit about how the um, uh, you know the sort of design methodologies, and 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 they were trying to understand a bit about how the um, the the I guess the structural design methodologies and how you know Caramba, the particular tool that we were using at the time, worked, and it was just a really awesome thing. And and uh, it's even more kind of abstract. I always thought that the kind of subject of computational design is really like defined in that intersection between. Um, you know, architectural design and and engineering design, because so often we're from both sides. Um, through the power of software, we're dealing with tools that are, um, you know, often analysis tools that that are kind of, you know, more the domain of the uh, of of the other half. Um, let's say, um, but yeah, I think I guess it kind of goes back to the subject of documentation and how do you design the user interface as to how you know how well these tools are are usable in an in a in a truly empowering way like by by people who don't necessarily have the same um, education um, as the people who created the tools um, yeah no, I agree and it's extremely powerful tools as well I mean of course like grass upper and the sort of geometric you know capabilities that um, you know, Rhino gives us is, you know, pretty, pretty extremely, you know, awesome and powerful itself. But then you also have like the, the enormous sort of ecosystem of, of plugins. And I mean, we saw Kangaroo, Ladybug, Caramba, like all these like extremely powerful tools are just sort of available, you know, in a way that it's never been before. Um, and uh, it also, I guess, opens up the idea of actually building these apps um, and sort of utilizing that intelligence in a way more accessible way uh, than it was maybe a couple of years ago. So it's it's an extremely interesting um, development. And also just to add on to sort of the analysis, uh, you know, perspective that we've been seeing in these uh, few presentations now, I think another super interesting opportunity was just sort of 
um, you know, remote solving, which what it's actually is, is the idea of actually doing um, parallel processing. I mean, I remember one of my first uh, internships um, worked for um, your Apple and we had like, we had a project and it was like, you know, thousands of load case combinations and like Friday late afternoon, we would press run on all these, <laughs> you know, thousands of load case combinations for analysis. And then we just like crossed our fingers the entire weekend, came back on Monday and oh no, there was an error pop up or something like that. Uh, but now like when you actually have, you know, the capabilities of running, you know, Karamba and, and you know, this sort of heavy environmental analysis um, routines in the cloud, then you can really like do some pretty awesome stuff in terms of uh, parallel computation, you know, utilize the fact that you can have, you know, hundreds of machines just running the same or like, you know, uh, different load case combinations and kind of stitch together uh, results and present it to you in, in a way that, you know, obviously wasn't possible you know, a couple of years ago. So it's uh, extremely promising. Yeah, and with the advent of, of cloud computing as well, you don't necessarily have to go out and, you know, procure all of these powerful machines and then worry about having to update them um, you know several years down the line you can just decide one morning oh, I want I want 100 virtual machines uh, you know this particular spec and hey presto you know 10 minutes later they're there and you know and two days later they they're no longer your problem you're no longer paying for them um, yeah. and we see a lot of um, uh, the the um, vendors of, of uh, and creators of uh, analysis tools as well kind of adopting uh, cloud computing as a, um, I guess, as a as, as something that a service that they're that they're providing. You know, run our tools in our like controlled environment, um, using you know with with our guys, um, guys, our people supporting you, um, and and that's something we see people ad adopting a lot, and then and then creating. Uh, different interfaces, be they you know, web-based interfaces or Rhino or Grasshopper-based interfaces or, you know, or wherever. Hello, I'm back. <laughs> I just wanted to add, um, I, I've uh, actually missed the, the part of discussion that's the closest to what I do uh, because I work, work for a, a furniture manufacturer. So all of the apps they have online are, are products configurators. And um, it's, it's just great to think outside of the box and uh, for me to use all of the tools that have been uh, created for architectural purposes, but I just um, take just the bits that I need and I use them for creating products, uh, which is amazing. <laughs> uh, I don't have to create these things from scratch and it's not a common practice to, to use these tools um, for um, product design. Uh, but the, when you when you think outside of what it is it for originally, uh, the possibilities are um, amazing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of the like a lot of the technologies that that I used to use in in design, you know, were the things that would have been like in a, a, a SIGGRAPH um, conference, you know, several years before. So you're going from like, um, uh, you know, computer visualization, you know basically um, uh, video game design now, I guess, through to like engineering and architecture, you know, people using bits and bobs for industrial design and product design as well. It's all a, a big, a big melting pot. Yeah, totally. It's, it's no point rediscovering America if you can use the, the gaming engines uh, to visualize products and then uh, use uh, things like Rhino inside of Revit to take the input from online applications, which are very clean and uh, user facing, and then create all of the um, uh, parts uh, in the factory from Grasshopper, but then all of the files for the architects through Revit. And um, it's possible to connect all these uh, programs. Uh, it's not always easy, but there are ways and there are, it's, it's really developing really quickly. Something that wasn't possible last month might be possible next month, and and we just have to be very uh, up to date with what's happening. Yeah, sometimes it's just a question of of did someone ask for it? You know, did someone express an interest in in in, in having it? Um, yeah, we, we we're lucky to have uh, Izzy with us, who is um, you, you know mentioned connecting different tools together. Um, this is you know speckles bread and butter. Um, 
yeah, I wonder if you could mention something about that, that, you know, that, that challenge, particularly how it relates to analysis tools. Um, yeah, so I, I feel like this intersection between like what different disciplines are using, like their different tools, like this is such like a key place for our like efficiency gains and like optimization by like creating tools like this and like empowering architects to do more analysis and like empowering engineers to like fiddle with the geometry a bit more. Because um, for example, I remember on several projects that I've done before where like um, like all the architects are very familiar with Rhino Grasshopper, all the engineers are very familiar with Revit. And in the UK, we use a separate that we have to use for certification in the UK. Um, so there was always this like back and forth and really like efficient like architect design, rebuild, uh, rebuild energy analysis, rebuild architecture, rebuild en energy analysis. And like this back and forth is like super unnecessary because if the architect has the capacity to like double check, run the analysis and see like a benchmark, even if it's not exactly the same as our analysis tool, if it gives them sort of like a benchmark of what where their design is heading, that is so helpful for everyone and kind of speeds the project along. Um, but yeah, one of the main things that Speckle is kind of coming up into is that like every application has a different way of representing da data and representing geometry. And that makes things quite difficult. Um, but if there are lots of different tools for analysis or kind of doing these repetitive calculations wherever you are, like it doesn't really matter. Um, because if you can do your analysis in this tool and then you can get the basic geometry out uh, into a different tool, like it doesn't necessarily matter where the analysis is running because like at the end of the day, most of the time, like these calculations are the same, no matter where you're doing them, you're just like doing them on slightly different data structures and slightly different models. Um, so yeah, the struggle in Speckle is really like getting that geometry and being able to propagate that out to all these different applications. So each discipline, each engineer, each architect can use what they're comfortable with, which is better for everyone, better for the project, more efficient um, and more enjoyable for everyone working on it, you know? <laughs> you're doing very important work, yes. <laughs> Cool. All right. Tough um, stuff. Yeah, abs abs absolutely. Yeah. I'm glad. I'm really glad someone's doing it. Yes. Um, okay, last last section um, uh, is is on kind of stuff that didn't really fit into kind of the er earlier categories and perhaps more focused on either the kind of geometry itself or the sort of artistic qualities of, of the geometry in, in, in one case an actual you know replication of a physical piece of art for instance um, so yeah we'll roll the uh, roll the last set of clips hello my name is Amar and I'll be sharing my work for the seminar cloud-based data management I'll be showing two very simple examples here the first one is a rotating form where there are a few slider inputs um, that change the rotation of the geometry, the amount of flaws, and the radius of the eclipse on the two points, as you see here. So this changes uh, the amount of flaws, and this changes the rotation um, of the flaws and the radius of the eclipse on the two endpoints. For the second example, I wanted to add color to this grasshopper definition, but constantly ran into errors um, and spent a lot of time tweaking and changing the grasshopper script as well as the JavaScript code, but could not figure it out. So instead, what I did was uh, internalize this geometry and added it to one of the other examples uh, Lewis shared with us um, and got this result. Um, it's like a, a spiral uh, stairs. Um, so here you can change the radius uh, of the spiral. And then you can also change um, the step count. Um, Yep. Um, yeah, I never, I never thought um, I'd be learning coding, but it has definitely been an interesting learning process to see how, with the help of um, Rhino Compute, uh, this can be applied to our work as architects as well, and how we can share it in a simple web browser user interface to, to the world, or to anyone who doesn't use 
um, understand uh, Rhino and, and Grasshopper. Um, it definitely took me a while to get used to the coding part of this um, seminar, um, but I'm slowly getting getting used to it. And, and there are still parts uh, I'm trying to wrap my head around, but I guess the more I hang around with these codes, the more familiar um, and comfortable I become. And yeah, I'm looking forward to see how uh, this can help me further in, in, in my practice as well. Um, and that's it. Thank you so much. So good morning, everyone. My name is Felipe. Um, I decided that this presentation, I will go quickly through some of the examples that we did during the seminar. And then I will run through my idea for my final project and then the, the um, uh, solution or the, the script that I develop. So overall, like, um, as part of the final submission, I define or I organize this uh, repository where you can see all the examples and the assignments. So some of like my assignments include a, this one, which was basically loading a 3DM file into, into Java, but then also we like assigning different um, the data to the to the geometry and this is as you can see here the geometry as you can see here is uh this the the project that we are developing on the moon final assignment i start with that idea of like a growing pattern and based on this article which is talking about biomimetics into design and what I really like from this article is the way that they use colors as a pattern. And then that uh, gave me like kind of like the inspiration that to develop my final project. So my final project was uh, I decided to use uh, only native components into Grasshopper. And what, what I was basically trying to do was to develop a, a Rubik cube which uh, then the user was, is allowed to change, say the size of the geometry, you can change the amount of, um, the amount of cubes in the, in the overall uh, Rubik cube, and then also the distance of all of them. And at the end, what I was developing was uh, that idea of playing with the different colors of, for the mesh and somehow recreating a, a different pattern. So what I'm using is I am um, adding like a mesh colors to the face normals. And then that is the, the code that, I, that I'm using to, that I'm running into the app server. And as you can see here, what I did also was to play a little bit with the interface. So I changed uh, the colors and I tried to give them like the same look and feel. And, and yeah, that's, like that's the, my final project. And then one, one of the things that I noticed is that um, when you have the, the geometry in the, like running in the app server, and because the HTML file is also having like a light and in the SCN, SCN. So you can see that the colors, like the final colors are different from the one that I, I was expecting to have in from Rhino itself, which actually I think is like really nice because it kind of like give me that um, idea of that, yeah, that that concept that I was trying to look for. Um, yeah, so in here, you can see on the sliders on one side, you can change size, amount and distance. And then at the end, of course, you can surf yourself and download the file and, and play around. So that's it. Thank you so much. And thanks Luis, Luis and Will, because um, it was a bit challenging for me, this seminar at the beginning, but like the fact that I can see this uh, working right now, it's like really, really good. So I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Bye.
everyone. Uh, this is Yara, and this is my final submission for the Digital Tools for Cloud-Based uh, uh, Data Management. Um, and here is a, uh, a website where I laid down all the projects uh, from the beginning, uh, from the first one until the um, uh, until the, the, the last one. Um, and so I will go with two or three uh, projects. So this is the first one where we understood the tools and process involved in creating interactive web applications, um, specifically um, or HTML. And here I use like image and text um, on a website. And if we go back, we can just uh, go to the second one. Being a, um, a layered uh, data on the interface um, with different uh, components of the model. And um, I'm gonna like jump to the final uh, project. And the third project is a definition uh, done um, in Grasshopper using the shortest walk. Um, and in a conclusion, it will run two sliders um, with a scale and a seed. And uh, this is all for this uh, submission. And um, thank you for your time. Hey guys, this is Varun Mehta. And today I will be presenting my project Hyper. Hyper is a form experiment that investigates concentric geometry pivoting on variating axis. Physically, this form was first fabricated in 2018 for Celebrate Bandra, a public art exhibition. The installation was made of stainless steel rings pivoting on perpendicular axes. People enjoyed interacting with this playful form, especially children. Since then, I've been investigating the idea of different scales while understanding the potential of this form experiment. And the data management seminar opened the door to web-based interaction. Being relatively new to Grasshopper, I really enjoyed creating a simple definition for Hyper. The definition simply offsets a circular curve into different rings. These rings are rotated through a simple slider that randomly converts angles into sine, cos, and tan values. This is my input geometry, whereas the output being the complete mesh. It would be too complicated for a user to have access to the rotation of eight rings and hence for easy control, we had a single input value. My priority was to keep the app simple for the user to interact with. After downloading the HTML source code, a few tweaks were made to the CSS with respect to the font styling. I rotated the slider positioning to a vertical slider in order to improve usability on mobile devices. I couldn't figure out how to add 3JS material onto my Rhino geometry. So I cheated a little bit and added four directional lights to mimic the mesh normal 3JS material. Initially, I envisioned to load all the output data before the user can see the model and attach a single input value to the scroll of the mouse, creating a very smooth user experience. This was too ambitious for the time, so I settled for two vertical sliders, two input values, keeping the user interaction very intuitive. One slider being the thickness of the rings,
and the other being the relative angle of rotation. The final output has no annotation to the sliders, creating a mystery for the user and inviting them to play with the toggles. This fits fine even on mobile devices. Thank you. My name is Shelly Livingston. This is my final project for data management. Uh, here, this is the Heroku site that I created with my twisted spine geometry, which has a material applied to it. Um, in addition, I added these sliders and changed the font and the size of the font. This is the grasshopper definition. Uh, again, here are the inputs with the count, length, and radius. And finally, this is my code under the twisted spine file. Uh, here's the font the size of the font, here are the sliders, length, radius, and count. Um, I added a material, and then finally I changed, or I played with the minimum and maximum and adjusted the steps as well. And that's everything. Thank you very much. And I hope to have my gallery up shortly as well. Thank you. All right, I think that's that's the last video, yeah? Okay. Um, I mean, what I, you know, what I find interesting about here, this group is, again, this discussion of um, users and having users and, you know, some of these, you know, a lot of, a lot of the videos we've seen kind of take on a similar UI. There's some sliders, there's some check boxes, but, you know, this example of, um, not having any any description of this what the slider does, you know these experiments with with UI UX and what users expect and how much you can get away with and and how that exploration becomes part of this uh, this whole experience. I find I find that pretty uh, uh, pretty interesting. Um, and also the you know learning the constraints of of the browser and the cloud and and I think now I mean I, I think more about when I'm in Rhino, I think more about what I'm, you know, what I'm building there and in Grasshopper, what I'm building there, I think it more through the lens of how that's going to solve remotely on compute and how I'm going to be able to show that. And is that going to be a performant much more than, you know, much more than before, you know, so now, you know, I'm, I'm much more uh, optimizing faces and using Draco compression and all that stuff um, much more than, than before. Uh, but I think this, yeah, this group of last group of videos, I think really just highlights the um, you know, what, it's not just about getting geometry there. It's, it's about um, making sure that it works well, making sure that, um, you know, people uh, can, can understand the experience, um, but also the, the ability to explore it as a medium. You know, this whole idea uh, this week, or this last week, I, I, I learned a new word, which is uh, fidgetal, which I think is much better than, than digital twin. You know, it's a, a digital object and a, and a, and a, and a physical object. Um, so this exploration of having, having both and how, you know, the capabilities of, of one medium versus the other um, informing one another, I think is a, a really important, uh, let's say, consequence of, of these, of, of working in this way. That's I don't know, more of a comment than, uh, than any particular question, but I think, um, you know, UI and user experience is, is important, um, both from an expectation standpoint, but also I think as an ability to, to go beyond what is expected and, and, and using it really as a, as a motivator for people to, to get into, uh, to use these interfaces.
I agree. And another comment to that, I think, is um, I mean, in, in the first category of, of um, you know, apps we saw that are sort of more project specific. I mean, even if, if you are the user and maybe like a few more colleagues are the users, there is still, you know, quite, quite a lot of room to actually create that user experience. Anyway, I think like with, um, you know, document, well, that's another discussion as well with the documentation, but, uh, um, you know, just, uh, you know, just description of what, what does the individual inputs do? Like, you know, what are the outputs? How does it work? All that stuff. Um, you would expect obviously that for products that are sort of launched for larger audiences, but I think there is definitely, you know, room for, for that sort of stuff, even if you are the user yourself or, you know, maybe you and your colleagues. So um, for sure, like the experience and, and, you know, the thought process, you know, uh, involved in just building sort of the product is, is obviously more than just, um, you know, generating the geometry and, and showing it, but also like the whole sort of package around it. So uh, it's, it's an important comment and um, yeah. It's good to ask uh, people who are completely not related to, to like 3D design and scripts to test your app. That's the best test ever uh, and see if that <laughs> works. <laughs> because we, we are so used to scripts and, and like complex ideas. Um, uh, we don't mind uh, just yeah, having the guts out and, and being able to tweak everything. That's, that's the dream of designers. But, the end user wants to see just a very simple UI and having it work uh, the first time they click, it has to work. Yeah. Yeah, there's often not a lot of, um, I guess, like digital sympathy um, from, from those <laughs> kinds of users, you know, whereas as a, as a, a, you know, someone who's created these tools, you, you, you have that kind of, you know, empathy with the, with the, person who created the tool that you're using when things don't quite work uh, right. But yeah, you need someone who's going to be brutal and going to tell you when it doesn't work. Showing it to children is also a great test. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking maybe grandparents as well, but uh, yeah, one or the other. Yeah, I think something that is even hard for me sometimes is to put myself in the shoes of not like me using the tool, but like who is the person using this tool and like how is this a different context than like, for example, even just looking at like the Rhino UI versus like a web UI, like with a Rhino UI to someone who's never used Rhino is ridiculously complicated. There's so many buttons and they're like, what on earth am I supposed to press to do what I want to do? Whereas like the browser, like the expectations are so different. So you really have to think about like who is using it and why, and then balance between like not having a UI that's too crowded with like descriptions of what everything does. Cause then that is also overwhelming for user just like coming into a new page and it's just like a paragraph of text for everything <laughs> and even if the tool like um like Emil was saying even if the tool is just for you and your colleagues like what if you put that tool down for like a couple months and come back to it on a later project like if it's not if the UI wasn't considered maybe you'll come back to the project and have to like re-dive through the code because you don't even remember what all the buttons are doing and like why you've made these decisions <laughs> in there done that for sure <laughs> <laughs> Nice, nice. Well, maybe we have a few minutes for some final comments. Um, and I'll just, uh, I'll go here. I have written some stuff here, but I think to, to all of the participants, we really appreciate your, um, you know, keeping with it. And, you know, I just wrote down some of these words that I've heard you mention, like a uh, byte array and Draco compression and, you know, using Node.js, you, you know, first time for your first GitHub repo, your first website, first GitHub pages, you know, really developing the, the stuff out in the, out in public, out in the open, um, letting people, you know, see all of all the good and the bad of, of, of what you're doing. I think it's uh, brave and I just, I want to celebrate the fact that uh, you all came on this journey. And I think, you know, whether you continue with this or not, I think you at least have, well, Maybe, maybe you start to have some empathy as, uh, as uh, Will just mentioned uh, uh, with the people who actually make these tools, um, or at least you're at least informed about you know, all the parts that potentially can go into, into making these tools. I guess my, my second sort of uh, final comment is, 
you know, I really loved how, how cons I mean, it's not very surprising, but how, how concerned you were with style, you know, how things looked, you know, at first, you know, the first um, kind of moments that we brought geometry onto the browser, you know, we're kind of maybe in like, I don't know, 1989, you know, rendering quality. Um, and, and you're all very concerned about, you know, how to at least um, exploit that to a certain extent or make it look better, um, make the performance better. Um, but, you know, don't, um, don't mistake that, that motivation because that motivation is what, what got you to, to learn, you know, how do I, you know, if I want to click, how do I make that transparent or, or what, how do I, you know, import my own kind of color scheme to all this, you know, that, that was a motivator that drove you to find out more about the tool, um, find out your own way to develop it. I mean, the, the fact that um, there was this, uh, uh, I forget who it was now, um, but um, you used four directional lights with four, with four different colors to show to to mimic the the mesh normal material because somehow you couldn't uh, you couldn't figure out how to use the material. I mean that's awesome. You figured out a way a, a different way to do it, um, and in that process, you know you understood about lights and things like this. So I think all of these things are really important to highlight. You know, find that motivator that's going to drive you to to continue learning through these things. I mean it was it's really a pleasure that that it was style because in the end, yeah. It, 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 it is important how things look. It is important to the user experience and it's important to, to the longevity sometimes of these tools. So I really appreciate um, that concern uh, emerging as a sort of a, a driver to, to keep you learning. Yeah, so thank you very much. Yeah, I'll just echo Luis's thanks. Thanks for coming on this, this, this journey and for kind of, I think this, this uh, uh, sort of seminar series has, it's kind of expanded because of the questions that were being asked as well. Um, we were really surprised and delighted by the uh, complexity of some of the, the, the final projects. I mean, a lot of the final projects um, were just stuff that Luis and I, I mean, I'm, I'm a simple engineer, so I've got an excuse. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I can just make, I can make my boxes. Um, but um, yeah, some some awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. Yeah, we look forward to sharing it with um, all of our McNeil colleagues. Um, I don't know if tomorrow night when we have a our dev meeting and we have our show and tell, we can show some of these things because um, yeah, I think it's always useful for them to see what what other people do with this stuff. Um, I'll open it up to to Izzy or Basia or Emil if you have any any closing comments. No, I'm just super impressed, as you say, like it's it's really impressive, the work. I mean, going from Grasshopper to actually like a functioning, you know, web application is a pretty big step. But uh, yeah, super, super impressive. And, you know, I, th I think this is an extremely, you know, useful tool for architects in general. Like it's not it's not like we're seeing a trend that is not, you know, going more into sort of automation and sort of calling into different systems, uh, you know, uh, sort of consuming different APIs and sort of hacking, hacking, hack, hacking your own little apps to, to sort of project spe specific needs. So it's, I think there is a lot of room for this sort of, uh, you know, competence in, 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 in the industry in general. So it's um, very impressed and it's, it's certainly, you know, um, yeah, very encouraging to see that um, you guys are interested in this. And I think you should definitely, you know, continue doing it because yeah, it's the future. So um, it's my speculation at least. Thank you. <laughs> I'd also like to just extend huge congratulations to everyone because I know like uh, for a lot of you, this was your first time even creating a GitHub project. And I think going from zero to hundred like this, going from like no previous experience, like really creating an application to doing a grasshopper definition in the cloud is just like super amazing. And I'm super impressed by all these projects. Um, and even if you don't go on to be software developers, that software developers like having these skills like as an engineer or as an architect i feel like it's so so valuable because like now you have the tools to like kind of alter tools that you see or like build upon what other people are doing and extend that to your own needs and you kind of understand what's possible and can better like direct other engineering teams like software development teams for like what exactly you need i think it's really crucial that you guys have these skills and it's really impressive what i saw today Yeah, great stuff for everyone. The first step uh, of like going into lines of code from Grasshopper is the hardest. So now that you've been through the JavaScript uh, first steps, uh, like the world is your oyster, 
going from JavaScript to Python and then going back to Grasshopper and, and reducing the amount of components you have in your code and then ad addressing the API, that's the next step. And it's so much easier to do when you have the basic understanding of uh, any other language written in lines. So yeah, so that's all the best to you. <laughs> and well, that's great. I wanna also thank uh, our, our panel members, uh, Basia, Izzy and Emil. Um, that's, it was awesome to have you here. Um, I, I knew that we were going to have a good conversation. Um, um, would love, you know, after such a thing to, to go, you know, get some lunch and, you know, continue the discussion. But alas, you know, it is what it is. Um, yeah, I was thinking that this is probably the longest <laughs> I've talked about computational design without a beer in my hand. So thanks for <laughs> coming, coming along. And that's just because uh, it's in the morning. That's not a, it's not a bigger thing. <laughs> Hey guys, so, um, I'm also here sitting in the background. I'm, I'm David, yes. hey, super hey. impressed. Um, I've, I've been flying the water in the whole pinup, but I'm, I'm, I'm super impressed about the, the amount of work and, and especially how high the, the bar have been placed for the students and how they've been able to, to go through everything in such a, a small period of, of time. And also uh, in parallel while learning other stuff that are also complex in the, in the other seminars of, of the module, which is, which is I think fantastic. But I think one, one of the things that really rem, uh, rem, uh, deserves recognition is the fact that you guys have been always there in the background, Louise and Will. So I, I think the students can also res resonate with me that you guys uh, have been there, uh, you know, fully supporting the, uh, the projects kind of 24 or seven uh, sometimes. <laughs> um, and it's, it's uh, I think, one of the main reasons why this have uh, come through. So thanks a lot, guys, as well. Yeah, that, that sort of uh, appearance of being online uh, 24 hours a day is just, just one that I've, I've picked up over the years working, working remotely. I do sleep. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so thank you very much to, to all the participants um, again, to the panelists, to David, Oana, thank you so much. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll look forward to putting, you know, compiling some of this together, um, putting it in some format that is uh, maybe, uh, you know, can continue to, to, to live beyond the, uh, the seminar. I think you, you'll have access to the, the compute server for a bit longer. So if you want to keep hitting it and, and keep messing with it, um, that's going to be around. Um, you know where to find us. Um, so thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for, for this amazing seminar. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. And, and thanks, uh, Will and Liz, for organizing such a nice session and uh, moderating the discussion. Um, I think we all got uh, a lot of interesting ideas and stuff, apart from seeing the brilliant work of the students. Bye, guys. So with this, I will uh, turn off the live.